Okay, I think I I shall start. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my heartfelt thanks I wish to convey to Professors Shanojak Shan and uh, Zeynep Oja, and Ararat, of course, uh, for his hardworking and very helpful role in organizing this conference. I wish also, I would like to express my sadness for Aisha Bura's absence. Uh, what she said about not being with us today is about a very abhorrent case of irony in Turkey. And I strongly condemn whoever is responsible for Osman Bey's being behind bars without any legal basis. And it is very clear that Osman Bey is behind the bars in spite of the European Court of Human Rights rulings, which stated that you cannot even take into custody this person based on the evidence you submit, but the high court, the highest court in this instance, and the constitutional court is silent. The uh, Court of Cassation upheld this uh, ruling that uh, now he's uh, under aggravated life sentence, which is a very harsh uh, uh, sentence. Uh, so, I mean, I don't know what we can do, but this shows something uh, about the situation uh, in Turkey, about the relationship of the state with the law uh, in Turkey. And uh, this is about my paper, actually. Uh, so, Turkey began with a revolutionary event, the proclamation of the Republic, on October 29. And since then, uh, the Turkish Republic endured for about 100 years, but it has never been democratic. It had some multi party bits, uh, like the one we have today, uh, but there's always a ambiguous relationship between the state and the law. Because uh, in, like many cases in European uh, constitutional developments, uh, unlike the American case, uh, in the European cases in France, most notably in Germany and in Turkey as well, state precedes uh, the constitution also so the formation of a legal system. So state always has, uh, state is always an entity which has an extra legal dimension. Uh, and this is best captured by the concept of sovereignty uh, in the continental uh, mother state developments. So uh, I think Mark Mazower yesterday mentioned, uh, sorry for the pronunciation if it's wrong, uh, mentioned uh, Ernst Frankel's uh, dual state uh, conception. Uh, and there, uh, Ernst Frankel is a very important figure. He's a uh, lawyer, uh, a Nazi period, who worked as a lawyer, a Jewish lawyer, somehow managed to work until 1939 or so, then fled to America uh, with his manuscript called Dopechstadt, uh, which is published in English as Dual State. And there he makes a distinction between dualistic state and dual state, where he says dualistic state is a state where uh, the state finds itself some room to act outside the law, outside the limits of law. So in constitutional practices, we know that if we have a constitution, then state should abide by the norms of the constitution, but there's, there has always been a room in continental European uh, legal experience uh, for the state to act unconstitutionally 
in times of uh, exception, in states of exception, or in extraordinary uh, situations. Uh, and this stems from uh, the uh, position of the state as the sovereign entity, so it is not limited by law in some uh, areas. Uh, now, this is a dualistic form, uh, and we know this in as early as Locke's treatise uh, on the second government, where he talks about uh, executive prerogative. Uh, but dual state is something different, and uh, I'm thankful for Mark uh, for mentioning this yesterday, because I, it's not in my paper, but now it is time, since we are also unfortunately, obviously, started with Osman Kavala the case. Uh, in Turkey now, it is a development, a development took place from a dualistic state to a dual state position. In the dual state, uh, we have a normative state working according to the legal norms, especially in fields of economics, uh, in property law, family law, etc. But in other areas, the state acts according to uh, the discretionary decisions of those who hold political power. So it's uh, somewhat arbitrary uh, in some cases. So law doesn't prevail. It's political, uh, political uh, matters or political considerations. Uh, instruct the way the state actors act. So bureaucrats, and this includes judges and prosecutors and many other state officials, they act sometimes according to the law, but sometimes according to the political considerations. But dual state is the state in which the normative state uh, and uh, what we call the prerogative state, they are together and they feed each other. So they actually help sustain their togetherness. <laughs> and Ernst Frankel <laughs> calls this uh, a theory of dictatorship. Uh, and we know from a legal and political theoretical perspective, dictatorships are transient. Uh, in the Roman case, for instance, or in uh, constitutional dictatorships in the modern times, dictatorships are uh, limited six month, uh, one year period of time uh, for restoring the constitutional order, which is in crisis. So leg legality is suspended for short periods of time. Or maybe dictatorship can be uh, prolonged, uh, but still transitory or uh, temporary. Uh, the establishment of a new constitution, for instance. But here in the Frankel's case, it is a permanent form of dictatorship, this dual state, the togetherness of the uh, normative and prerogative states. Uh, and well, it took me some time, but uh, Turkey began with a dualistic state and since 2017, constitution changed and all the powers of the state are concentrated in the hands of a single individual, which is directly elected by the people as president of the republic. So the republic, the president of the republic now holds uh, executive power uh, and he has a good control over the judicial processes. He also, as the leader of a political party, which holds a majority of seats in the parliament, he also holds the, the parliament, the legislature. So uh, this is a state uh, in which sovereignty is in the hands of a single person, and that single person is elected by the people directly. And this is called populism in today's uh, theoretical, fashionable Term, uh, but uh, it is a form of dictatorship, actually. Uh, maybe populist or uh, something else. 
but it is sustainable in this dual state formation. And it has roots in 1923. It has roots in the formation of the Turkish Republic. So let me turn to my paper and what my problem is uh, in this paper today. Uh, the problem I wish to address here is that the uh, proclamation of the Republic it was considered to be a revolution in Turkish history. It, it is a revolutionary moment in Turkish history. But what does this revolution mean? To answer this question, we have to have a conception of revolution. Uh, sometimes we have a conception, class conception of revolution, like we have, we mentioned bourgeois revolutions in, uh, in the American case, in the French case, late 18th century. Sometimes we talk about the Soviet revolution, which is the proletarian revolution. Uh, likewise, in the Turkish case or in other cases where a bourgeois revolution takes place without the bourgeoisie, so uh, this might be a revolution which is uh, realized by a group called vanguards of a bourgeois uh, state, uh, or it might be a revolution from above, uh, etc. But uh, I'm not going to go into these uh, different uh, conceptions of revolution, but I would like to concentrate my paper on the legal and political meaning of uh, the Republic as a revolution. And I depart from uh, my point of departure uh, is the concept uh, of revolution as defined by Hanare. It is a very normative uh, definition of revolution. Anna Arendt defines revolution as a new beginning. We have to make a distinction between revolutionary changes and like civil strife or what the Greeks were called stasis uh, or kudeta uh, or uh, maybe before that there was a French term les majeste. Uh, palace school, uh, et cetera. Revolution is something different. <clears throat> it's a new beginning for RM. Uh, it is a new beginning that uh, includes some degree of liberation. So it is related to the concept of liberty uh, and freedom. And for Arendt, freedom is political. It's a political concept. Uh, so we have this distinction, maybe you are familiar with that, negative liberty and positive liberty. Uh, negative liberty is the concept Aaron talks as mentions as liberation, but positive liberty is participation in the political public life of the society. So a revolution in Aaron's term, there has in order to for us to be able to speak about a revolution, there has to be a democratic beginning that somewhat uh, captures these two dimensions of the revolution as defined by RN. And war of liberation or war of independence, uh, actually the initial wording for that struggle was the uh, struggle for the rights of the nation. It later became war of independence, then war of liberation, that sort of thing. But initially, this is important. I will come to that later. But uh, there has to be a democratic beginning with its own new founding principles. Something new must be created. And this new creation should involve liberation and political freedom. Uh, now, Turkish revolution uh, did not happen overnight, of course. I mean, 100 years ago today, uh, and it is nearly 6.30 in Turkey now, 6.30 p.m. 
in a few hours, uh, hundred years ago, Mustafa Kemal will come together with uh, his associates. I would say this term. I don't know if it's okay. Uh, around the table, and he will say, uh, "Gentlemen, we are going to declare the republic tomorrow." Uh, so the revolution takes place next day, next morning on October 29, uh, in the form of a ordinary parliamentary act, a statute, uh, which changes the constitution. The constitution is, was 1921 constitution made by uh, the Turkish Grand National Assembly. Now the law, which declared that the form of government is a republic passed by the Turkish parliament in October 29, 1923, was entitled, was a very interesting title. It says, a law changing the constitution with an aim to clarify some of the articles in the constitution. So, the, the law, October 29 law, which says the form of the government of the Turkish state uh, is republic, actually it, it does not do something new. It says we are clarifying some of the articles in the constitution, but um, it does more. Uh, it makes some amendments to other articles. Uh, as well, like uh, it inserts uh, the state, the religion of the state is the religion of Islam, etc. But uh, 1921 constitution, actually, if we take this law of October 29 uh, as a starting point of the revolutionary change in Turkey, uh, actually, the law itself declares that the revolution began with. 1921, the making of the 1921 constitution. But when we look at the process which ended or resulted in 1921 constitution, it started in 1918, after armistice, I think. Yeah, yeah after Montrose. Yeah. So uh, there's a whole bunch of formation of congressional power organizations, uh, if I may mention the late uh, Professor Blantaner's work on uh, local congressional organizational formations. Uh, so uh, Turkish revolution is a revolution which spans a time frame from 1918 to maybe we can Ended in 1937, uh, the formation of the Republic as uh, a state. But here we see some, and that's my title, uh, some antinomies. Uh, by antinomy, I mean there are competing or contesting thesis about the meaning of the revolution, the Turkish revolution. One thesis, you see it, is actually we know it as the concept of tutelage, uh, which is actually a translation of the Turkish term vesayet. Uh, and <clears throat> this is actually a, a way of theoretical way of looking at Turkey's political development uh, during the transition from uh, Ottoman Empire to uh, the formation of the Turkish Republic. Uh, and it is usually seen as the formation of a modern state. Uh, and there's a good work with this title, it's a very old one, but I use that in my thesis, in my doctoral dissertation uh, back in 1986, uh, edited by Ali Kazancıgil and uh, Ergun Özbudun. And Ergun Özbudun uh, has an article there, The Nature of the Kemalist 
political regime. And he says the eventual aim of the, the Kemalist Republic was democracy, to achieve the democracy. So if you follow the lines of the Kemalist uh, Republican ideology, you will reach a democracy in the end, but you have to go through a process of authoritarian formation because uh, in the words of Atatürk, uh, he said, we cannot wait. I mean, in France or in Europe, uh, the left clashed with the right. Uh, years, centuries passed, struggles took place. Then uh, a democratic order is established. Do we have time? Does this nation have enough time ahead of itself or enough blood in its veins? So we have to do whatever we want to do immediately. So you have to use force. Political power should be exercised in the form of coercion to uh, make uh, a revolution in politics and uh, other areas of social relationships, changing economy, society, etc. And that's what he actually undertook. To, uh, to make, but uh, this this is the authoritarian mentality. So the first thesis, the Tutelich thesis, accepts that the republican formation was authoritarian, but with an intent of eventual democratization. Of course, democratization in a Muslim society has some certain problems of its own, uh, and I'm not supporting this opinion, obviously, but from this perspective, the state elites think that since these people are Muslims, they have to be educated. To, and that's what tutelage is about, yeah? You tutor people uh, so that they can learn what democracy is about. The second thesis uh, argues that, no, this is not true. There was a democratic beginning with the collapse of the Ottoman Empire or during the last final years of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, 1921 was a constitution with democratic potentials, uh, but uh, in 1923, with the proclamation of the Republic, we uh, switched to, or there was a drastic shift from a potentially democratic formation in the early years, in the early 1920s, to a, a, a actually sustainable dictatorship under many different forms. Uh, so multi-party politics, transition to multi-party politics in 1950, for instance, uh, from this perspective, is not a transition from authoritarian uh, single party regime to a democratic one, but it is from a transition from uh, a single party dictatorship to a multi party, but restricted, very restricted multi party uh, system, which is also a form of maybe uh, not maybe a dictatorship in the classical sense, but uh, another form of authoritarian uh, politics. <laughs> Now, these two theses uh, have strong arguments and strong strong supporters. They have a logic. Uh, the best uh, instance of the first thesis uh, is seen in, well, in the works of scholars who tried to understand Turkish political formation after the Republic. Really? No, I, 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 I think I have done. <laughs> I, I said. <laughs> 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 
Okay, sorry. So, okay, so I'll be quick. <laughs> okay, so this is an antinomical revolution. Here, antinomy, I borrow this concept from Andrew Arato. Antinomy means two different interpretations of a revolutionary event. Both have strong arguments. Each have its own logic, so they are understandable, but they cannot be together. They are mutually exclusive, exclusive and diametrically opposite uh, interpretations. Now, uh, for Arato and for me as well, uh, the concept of sovereignty is one of the sources of this uh, antinomy. Uh, and it is reflected in the 1921 constitution, article one. Sovereignty, that says, belongs unconditionally and without any restriction to the nation, period. But the article continues. The form of government or governance or administration uh, is, I mean, rests on the principle that people should uh, take in its own hands directly its right to self-determination. The big problem is who is the pupil? So who is the pupil and who is the nation? We heard wonderful papers yesterday about who is a Turk and the meaning of Turkishness, etc. Uh, but it wasn't uh, a debate in uh, the 1920 parliament. The meaning of the people was debated. Uh, but here, the antinomy is, uh, when you talk about national sovereignty, uh, it is unlimited power. But when you talk about popular sovereignty, it is democratic principle because national sovereignty can be exercised in the form of representative institutions. So what the Republic do in 1923 and with the making of the 1924 constitution, they said Turkish Grand National Assembly is the only sole representative and the sole institution where national sovereignty is realized. So in the words of Adnan Menderes, for instance, uh, the Turkish Grand National Assembly can do anything. There's no restrictions for the uh, parliament, parliamentary majority. So this, is a, this is an antinomic situation because sovereignty, in Arendt's words, is synonymous with tyranny for Arendt. And this is true because sovereignty is unlimited, uh, like divine power. You take divine power of the sultan and give it to the divine power of the nation and nation is represented by the parliamentary majority. But later on, uh, the nation, national sovereignty might be represented by the military as in the coup d'etat. Or later on, now today, for instance, the nation might be represented in the personality of the president, which it did in uh, Reichstag, uh, in the Third Reich. Uh, okay, so uh, this, uh, the, anti the solution of the antinomic beginning after 23 uh, paved the way for uh, an idea of sovereign uh, that governs Turkey. So that sovereign might be parliamentary majority, an institution of the state, this might somewhat sometimes take the form of the judiciary, which is called the tutelage in a very awkward sense. So, we, I mean, there was a chance in 1921 for Turkey to resolve these antinomies uh, in the way the Americans did. And let me just read the quotation from Hannah Arendt, and I'll stop there. The great, and in the long run, perhaps the greatest American innovation in politics as such was the consistent abolition of sovereignty within the body politic of the Republic. 
the insight that in the realm of human affairs, sovereignty and tyranny are the same. How does this happen? Small republics of the Amer that preceded the American Revolution uh, gave the authority to the Philadelphia Convention that drafted the 1787 Constitution. And before that, it, everything happened in legal continuity. And I see a very uh, stunning, in fact, uh, resemblance here. Of course, nothing is identical. Societies are very different, but uh, the local Congress says those formations, those local organizations could be stated or considered as a Turkish example of the uh, small republics that preceded the American Revolution. Uh, and in the 1921 constitution period, when 1921 constitution was made, 1876 constitution was also in force. So there was a legal continuity and you could see that legal continuity in the first day of the Grand National Assembly in Ankara on the 23rd of April in 1920. So there was this uh, legal continuous but revolutionary transition possible in the days of 1921 till 1923 before Mustafa Kemal attempted to renew somewhat illegally against the constitution, uh, the Turkish Grand National Assembly elections. So uh, he had a, um, and parliament, he had a parliament under his control. So he passed this law for the Republic, then made the 1924 constitution. And after that, all these reforms to change or to revolutionize the society. But you know the rest of the story, I think. <laughs> <laughs>